Hey everyone, this is a piece called Communists Against Jews, the Anti-Zionist Campaign in Poland in 1968 by Simon Ganzinger. Here's a little introduction or abstract. Quote, everything started collapsing then, end quote. Wrote Helena Zwadzka who survived the Shoah in Poland, about her experience of 1968 in communist Poland when dozens of Jews committed suicide after they found themselves publicly vilified and socially isolated, denounced as a, quote, fifth column, end quote, by the Vladislav Gomolka, excuse me, by Vladislav Gomolka, the first secretary of the Polish United Workers' Party. 8,300 members were expelled from the Communist Party, nearly all Jewish. 9,000 Jews lost their jobs, some were beaten up, and hundreds were thrown out of their apartments. Simon Ganzinger tells the story of the left-wing anti-Zionist campaign that destroyed Poland's Jewish community. Introduction Travelers at Dworzec Gdansky, a train station in the north of Warsaw, may notice a plaque that says, quote, here they left behind more than they possessed, end quote. Put up in 1998, it commemorates the departure of thousands of Polish Jews who, 30 years earlier, were forced to leave the country for no other reason than their being Jewish. Organized by the Polish United Workers' Party, the PZPR, the anti-Zionist campaign of 1968 to 1971 destroyed a Jewish community which had only just reestablished itself after the Holocaust. It was a gruesome example of left-wing anti-Semitism inflected as, quote, anti-Zionism, end quote. The assault on the Jews seemed teemed with declarations against anti-Semitism on countless rallies, people carried signs that read, quote, anti-Semitism anti no, anti-Zionism yes, end quote. Yet of the 8,300 members expelled from the Communist Party, nearly all were Jewish. Almost 9,000 Jews lost their jobs and hundreds were thrown out of their apartments. The regime allowed Jewish citizens to leave the country under two conditions. They must revoke their citizenship and they must declare Israel as the country of their destination. Thereby the regime legitimized the purge in the most cynical fashion. Why would these people go to Israel if they hadn't been Zionist all along? <clears throat> Many Jews seized the opportunity. Whereas in, Oct in April 1967, only 29 applied for exit visas to Israel, the number rose to 168 one year later and reached 631 in October 1968. Estimates for how many Jews left Poland between 1968 and 1971 vary. The most conservative holds the number to be 12,000. Earlier estimates believe that more than 20,000 were forced out of the country. The correct figure might lie somewhere in the middle, about 15,000. Fewer than 30% ended up in Israel, with the rest going to other countries, including Sweden, France, and the United States. The Zionist, quote, fifth column, end quote. After Israel's victory in the Six-Day War, the member states of the Warsaw Pact, with the exception of Romania, cut diplomatic ties with Israel. The developments in Poland, however, soon took a peculiar course. On 19th of June 1967, one week after the suspension of diplomatic relations with Israel, Vladislav Gomolka, the first secretary of the PZPR, made a remarkable comment on the Polish dimensions of the events in the Middle East. Some Polish Jews, Gomolka was sorry to hear, sympathized with the enemies of socialism, the quote, Israeli aggressors, end quote, thereby forfeiting their claim to be loyal Polish citizens. These people were not just morally reprehensible, they also constituted a potential, quote, fifth column, end quote, in the country, which had to be eradicated before it could gain strength. The significance of Gamolka's fifth column remark can hardly be overestimated. The term invoked a well-organized Zionist conspiracy whose center is to be found in the Jewish community, which in 1967 counted no more than 30,000 members of a Polish population of 32 million. 
when Gamoka gave his speech, he had already been exposed to the anti-Jewish fabrications of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, MSW, for some months. The ministry was led by Michislav Mas Masar, whose fervently anti-Semitic views were no secret to his comrades. Even before June 1967, high-ranking Ministry of Internal Affairs officials took a special interest in the Jew activities of Jewish institutions in Warsaw and popularized the notion of a Zionist infiltration among party circles. Under Massar's lead, the MSW worked tirelessly to gather information on individual Jews and expose their alleged links to Israel, which meant in most cases to distort or invest these ties. Also thanks to the opposition of Politburo members against Mossar's machinations, Gomolka's imaginary Zionist enemy within Poland did not attract much attention in the broader public, with the exception of the military where the majority of Jewish officers were dismissed as Zionist and revisionist. The anti-Zionist campaign did not gain traction until March 1968 when the, the full-blown assault on the fifth column shook the country. Anti-Semitism against protesting students. It is tempting to look at history as an orderly chain of events, but those entangled in this chain lack the comfort of hindsight. The order of things is lost on them, and so is the irony that posterity likes to attribute to history when it has collapsed into utter irrationality. On the 30th of January, 1968, 300 students protested the ban of the allegedly anti-Russian play Ziadi, D-Z-I-A-D-Y, by the romantic author Adam Mikievitz, not suspecting how could they that their courageous acts would usher in the anti-Zionist frenzy of March 1968. Needless to say, the student protest that preceded the purge of Zionists from the country had as little relation to the Middle East as had the anti-Zionist who, some weeks later, called on, quote, Zionists, bracket, to go, end bracket, to Siam, end quote. This demand was emblazoned on a banner at a rally. The writer apparently thought Zionist came from Siam because of the phonetic proximity of the two terms in Polish. The history of anti-Semitism lacks order as much as the anti-Semites lack understanding. Until immediately before the campaign, the public was captivated by the academic protest and perfectly unperturbed by Zionism. The sudden appearance of the Zionist specter in the chronology of student unrest reminds us not only of the deceitful continuity of historical events, so we have historic events, but also of the violent rupture of thinking, which is so typical of anti-Semitism. As a punishment for their involvement in the Zadi, Ziadi protest, two students, Henrik Slifer and Adam Michnik, who happened to be Jewish, were expelled from the University of Warsaw. On the 8th of March, a Friday, their colleagues responded with a large demonstration at the university, which was brutally dissolved by security forces. The demand for freedom of speech and civil rights, however, was soon heard at campuses all over the country, and before the weekend was over, tens of thousands of students and sympathizers rallied for this cause. The regime got nervous. The protests had grown too large and too little time to be quietly suppressed. If the voice of the workers entered the chorus of calls for free speech and free education, the student unrest could quickly evolve into a fully-fledged rebellion. In the MSW headquarters, everything was prepared to defang the movement in its early stage. Mossar's men, utilizing their recently acquired knowledge, compiled lists of alleged leading instigators, most of them Jewish. After Gamolka and other high-ranking party members had approved the document, it was handed to the press, with the intention to neutralize the protests by kindling a campaign against alien provocateurs. The working masses, the reasoning seemed to be, would hardly join ranks with a Jewish elite. 
quote, complete removal of Zionist elements, end quote. The publication of the list alone would have sufficed to brand the official propaganda against the student, student unrest as an anti-Semitic stunt. And while the official party organs were content with calling out Jewish-sounding names, it took the newspaper of the Catholic splinter group Pax, Slovo Pozhezna, to give the conspiracy, which had seduced the Polish youth, its proper name. The article, to the students of the University of Warsaw, published on the 11th of March, made the link to Gomolka's famous, excuse me, infamous Zionist fifth column. The author unveiled the Zionist plot, quote, to undermine the authority of the political leadership of People's Poland, end quote. Unfortunately, the readers were assured, quote, anti-Semitic sentiments are alien to, bracket, the Polish youth, end bracket, end quote. And so they certainly would not take it the wrong way when they are informed that the main organizers of the demonstration at the University of Warsaw were natural-born Zionists who, quote, held meetings at the, quote, babble, end quote, club of the Social and Cultural Association of Jews, end quote. The public gladly took the hint. From now on, the media abounded with condemnations, denunciations, and exposure of Zionist traitors. Within the next 10 days, 250 articles are published, a good portion of which endorsed the anti-Zionist conspiracy theory. But the campaign was not restricted to hateful columns in magazines or outraged talking heads on television. In more than 100,000 public meetings in factories and party offices, even in sports clubs all over Poland, anti-Zionist resolutions were passed. One representative resolution from the beginning of April reads, bracket, excuse me, quote, bracket, we demand, end bracket, a complete removal of Zionist elements and other enemies of our socialist reality from the political, state, administrative, educational, and cultural apparatus, and also from social organizations. Um. Those who in their nihilism and cosmopolitanism poison the spirit and heart of the youth should lose their influence on the youth, end quote. While the Jewish community was spared a nationwide pogrom, physical violence accompanied the aggressive rhetoric. Jewish journalists were beaten up, Jewish co-workers bullied, and Jewish students subjected to particularly harsh treatment at the hands of Mossar's militia. In this atmosphere, which according to historian Darius Stola, amounted to a, quote, symbolic pogrom, end quote, dozens committed suicide after they had found themselves publicly vilified and socially isolated. Gomolka, quote, Zionist will leave, end quote. While the campaign certainly could not have been initiated without the knowledge and consent of Ladislav Gomolka, the first secretary did not comment on its anti-Zionist anti spin for an oddly long time. More than one week after the publication of the incendiary article in Slovo Povshechna on 19th of March, Gomolka finally set out his views about the role of Zionism in the current events before a large assembly of party activists. The main culprit of the student unrest, he said, were revisionary and reactionary elements, some of which Gomolka intimated were Jewish. The Jewish population of Poland, Gomolka went on, could be divided into three groups, Polish, Cosmopolitan, and Zionist. While the first and largely largest group proudly serves its fatherland and the second could at least be tolerated the third group quote polish citizens who are emotionally and in their thoughts connected to the state of israel end quote will leave the country by making this division gomolka played down the importance of a zionist conspiracy while at the same time acknowledging the zionist conspiracy's existence a significant portion of the audience expressed their discontent with the first secretary's perceived leniency and demanded that Gomolka give names. Gomolka's futile attempts to calm the crowd and, open, and the open display of defiance attested to the rapid dynamic of the anti-Semitic witch hunt, which had ceased to be a contained campaign controlled by the party. Over the next few weeks, while Poland was gripped by the anti-Zionist fever, the Jewish community could not do more than hold its breath and wait for the frenzy to ebb away. 
In June 1968, the Central Committee decided to discontinue the campaign. At the Fifth Party Congress in November, Zionism was no longer on the agenda. When asked by a comrade whether the protests in March were linked to a Zionist conspiracy, the Attorney General replied, quote, No, we have no proof whatsoever for this supposition. End quote. For the victims of the campaign, the supposition impacted brutally on their lives in Lodz. I don't know how you actually say that. Let me see real quick. I don't think that's how you say that at all. I think it's like, there's some fucking shit like that. Polish. Polish to English. Well, that's taken forever, so I guess I won't be doing that. In Lutz, or whatever the hell it's called, where the anti-Semitic campaign raged without restraint, the city's newspaper dismissed Jewish journalists. The administration of the local eye clinic demanded baptism certificates from the physicians, and the local PZPR propaganda bureau published educational material that approvingly quoted the protocols of the elders of Zion, after less than two months, the Jewish population of Lodz, once a thriving center of Jewish culture and business, was driven out of the city. Anti-Zionism is an inflection of anti-Semitism. The plausibility of a Zionist conspiracy was hardly self-evident in 1968 in Poland. The absurdity of this idea was captured in a comment by a local farmer in Vlaz. Chova, who said, quote, up to now we've heard that the peasants and workers ruled Poland, while in reality the Jews do, end quote. One could easily sympathize with the farmer of Vlasova, who one bizarre idea had been superseded by another. Most of the writers who, who have studied the campaign have argued that its anti-Zionism was simply anti-Semitism in disguise. This, quote, identity thesis, end quote, as I would like to call it, holds that anti-Zionism is a surface phenomenon that can be reduced to classical anti-Semitism. The meaning of anti-Zionism then consists in anti-Zionism being a direct translation of anti-Semitism into a socially permissible code. Quote, Zionists mean, quote, means, quote, Jews, like a euphemism refers to the tabooed term. You say the first, but you actually mean the latter. There's a lot to say in favor of the identity thesis, apart from the fact that the campaign chiefly targeted Jews and people who were believed to be Jewish. Many of the classical elements of anti-Semitism also characterized the events of March 1968. The conspiracy theories, the paranoia, the anti-intellectualism, anti-cosmopolitanism, all of which featured in the campaign had been part and parcel of the ideological repertoire of Jew hatred since the 19th century. Still, I believe there is more to it. When anti-Semitism appears as anti-Zionism, it is not merely replicated in a different language. Rather, anti-Semitism undergoes a profound transformation. The displacement of, quote, Jews through, quote, Zionists modifies the ideological structure of anti-Semitism. The object that is hated, that is, in Poland 1968, the Zionist, resonates with the, quote, obscure impulse, end quote, the unconscious motive that drives the anti-Semite. Instead of being a codified version, the anti-Zionism of March 1968 was an inflection of anti-Semitism. I borrow the term, quote, inflection, end quote, from linguistics. It refers to the fact that, in many languages, we have to change the structure of words in order to convey a certain meaning in accordance with the grammatical context. By inflecting the verb to be, for example, we get the word forms is or was, and we use one or the other depending on whether we are talking about the present or the past. Anti-Semitism can also be inflected. Anti-Semitism's grammatical context, however, is society itself. In the example I mentioned, the word, or to be more precise, the lexeme, quote, to be, end quote, 
looks nothing like the inflected form it corresponds to. It is, as it were, obscure, like the impulse of the anti-Semites, which, in the work of Theodore W. Adorno and Max Horkheimer, gives rise to a, quote, system of delusions, end quote. The forms these delusions take are irrational, but not haphazard. The specific ideological expression of anti-Semitism at any one time is governed by its historical circumstances. But what was the context that made the anti-Zionist inflection form more adequate, more potent, more cohesive than its uninflected base form? The public disapproval of old forms of anti-Semitism certainly played a part. But that was not all. The campaign of 1968 exemplified the ideological innovation that anti-Zionism brought to anti-Semitism. The apprehension of the political conspiracy. When the crackdown on students turned anti-Zionist, it became an imminently political witch hunt. The role of the political is key to understanding the relation of anti-Zionism to traditional anti-Semitism. The old anti-Judaic and anti-Semitic images, such as the identification of the Jews with the murderers of Christ or the identification of the Jews with capital, had limited applicability under the social conditions of People's Poland, where the salience of the political was apparent to everyone. Instead, another aspect of anti-Semitism rose to prominence. The identification of Jews with the abstract state apparatus. The address of the political conspiracy. The political conspiracy has always been a quintessential element of modern anti-Semitism, just as the Jewish dominance of the economy is anti-Semitic stock and trade. Both in the economic as well as in the political sphere, the idea of a Jewish conspiracy stems from the obsessive desire to concretize social relations. The concretization of the abstract, an attribute horrendously accurate to describe modern society, is not a purely theoretical enterprise. The anti-Semite relates to the world through his delusional representation of the world. The historian and political theorist Moish Pastone writes that in National Socialism, the Jews became the, quote, personifications of the intangible, end quote. The campaign in Poland illustrates that the anti-Zionist image of Israel facilitates this process of obsessive concretization in the political sphere. The political conspiracy is made tangible in Zionism, and consequently, the political conspiracy can be attacked in Israel's alleged, alleged lackeys, the, quote, Zionist, end quote. Spring 1968 offers us ample material to support this thesis. An article in the Army Daily, Solnir's Volnowski, informed its readers about, quote, Israel's fantastic network throughout the world, end quote. That is the, quote, source of the might of the espionage services directed from Tel Aviv, end quote. Edvard Girek, who followed Gamolka as first secretary in 1970, pointed to the crooked political ambitions of the Zionists before an audience of 100,000 in Katowice. I'm, not, I'm just like saying these names. I don't know if I'm saying them right at all. Quote, this is done in the interest of old political speculators who act without any scruples. End quote. Girek then delivered a sequence of well-known Jewish names. Quote, these Zombrovskis, these Stasivis, Stasivis, Stasivskis, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Sol, Slonimskis, Slonimskis, all in the plural to erase any doubt that they are not individual human beings, but representatives of a clandestine organization. Quote, Zionism, end quote, is to uncanny political power 
what, quote, the Rothschilds are, end quote, excuse me, quote, Zionism is to uncanny political power, what, quote, the Rothschilds, end quote, are to the global Jewish cartel, the proper name for a paranoid idea. One of the most prominent slogans during the campaign was the fight against, quote, international Zionism, end quote. The oxymoron expresses the ideological function of the Zionist conspiracy in its most condensed form. The anti-Semite imagines the Jewish conspiracy is unbound and pervasive, that is, as, quote, international, end quote. But the anti-Semite also seeks to identify, grasp, and annihilate it. In the distorted representation of Zionism, the anti-Semite gives the conspiracy an address and a name, thereby melding together two contradictory elements of anti-Semitism, the ubiquity of the hated object and the desire for concretization. The concretization of the economic sphere is not at odds with the concretization of political power. Anti-Semitism embraces the Rothschilds and the, quote, Zombrovskys, Stazevskys, Slonimskys alike. The reckless profiteer of traditional anti-Semitism and Zurich's, quote, political speculators, end quote, are two forms, two inflections of the same anti-Semitic obsession to make the world accord with one's delusions. The article in Zolnitz Volnowski is a case in point. Its author closes his tirade against the Zionist traitors with the synthesis of old and new anti-Semitism, quote, their aim was to serve foreign interests, to serve imperialism and anti-Polish and anti-socialist subversion. Their homeland is the American dollar, regardless of whether they receive it from Tel Aviv, Bonn, or Washington. End quote. For the anti-Semites, the Jews have always had control over economic power, and the Jews have hated and to me. For the anti-Semites, the Jews have always had control over economic power. And the anti-Semites have hated and envied the Jews for this hallucinatory alliance with money. In anti-Zionism, then, the anti-Semitic hatred of Jews has consolidated itself within the political realm. In Poland, the purge of the Zionists from the military, the party, the administration, and public institutions was the purge of the Jews from the political sphere. This is the meaning of, quote, Zionism, end quote, in anti-Zionism, the Jew as political being, as Sitoyen. Since the anti-Semitic campaign of 1968 located its objects within the political sphere, it was almost necessarily bound to appear as anti-Zionist anti-Semitism. On the 15th of March, an article in the party paper Tribuna Ludu, or Ludu, I don't know, L U D U, revealed how international Zionism maintains its paradoxical character. Quote, bracket, the Zionist leaders, and bracket, obliged the rest of the Jewish community scattered all over the world, instigating among it feelings of nationalism and religious fanaticism to lend an all round support to Israel. The assistance for which the Zionist leaders call is therefore an assistance for Israeli expansionism, behind which stands the forces of imperialism, particularly West Germany and American imperialism, end quote. Throughout the campaign, the connection of Zionism to West Germany and the U.S. was a popular theme, although the pamphleteers could not quite agree on who secretly manipulated whom. The fusion of the economic conspiracy and the political conspiracy can be seen in an article in Gloss Plassi from nineteen excuse me from the eighteenth of March quote bracket Zionism end bracket hobnobbed with French and British capital and even was born under the influence of that capital recently dot 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 with American and West German imperialism end quote. Beyond Poland, 1968. The hateful vigor of the anti-Semites often correlates to the cohesion of their delusion. Anti-Semites want their objects to be easily and identifiable and ready at hand. 
the Zionist boogie that was conjured up in March 1968 served this purpose. In the Zionist fifth column, the delusion of Jewish world dominance manifested itself in the political sphere. The Polish case helps us understand the ideological function of anti-Zionism within anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism localizes a hitherto politically indeterminate conspiracy. And the grim fate of 15,000 Polish Jews who are forced into emigration poignantly reminds us that the target of anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is not just the Jewish state, but the people for whose protection the Jewish state was founded.